Uh, I introduce myself, I'm Karl Einhäupel, I'm CEO of the Charité and in my former life I have been a neurologist. Um, we decided to select this topic uh, because uh, innovation uh, in biomedicine changed a lot in uh, the last decades. And I will start, before I introduce the distinguished uh, panelists, uh, I will start to make a few comments concerning what changed in last decades. First is the complexity of biomedical research increased a lot. The second is that the innovation cycle shortens. That means that the innovation process is much faster than 20 years ago. My second statement is that there's a huge gap between the basic science results and the clinical applications of this basic science results. And this gap increased. My first statement is that the funding of innovation gets more and more difficult all over Europe, I have to say probably all over the world if you look to the United States also. I think the cost of innovation also rise dramatically. And six, my sixth point is that there's a huge, and that's my most important point, there's a huge segmentation concerning the particip participants of this innovation process. That means that universities, that uh, public funded uh, non-university research centers and industrial research uh, is really not, not good enough connected. And that's the second gap I realize is the utilization of innovation is very different in different countries, especially the gap between poor countries and richer countries is increasing. So we have to face these problems and we have to think about how can we overcome this situation. And I'm proud that uh, we have the opportunity uh, to get information from three very distinguished persons in that field and I will introduce everyone shortly uh, before he speaks. So we start with the first speaker, and the first speaker is Peter Cruz. Peter Cruz is president of the Max Planck Society, which is a very powerful uh, research society in medical and biomedical research. Uh, I think it is the best we have in our country. And since 2002, he is uh, president of this organization. Uh, originally, he's a biologist trained in Darmstadt. Then he went to the Deutsche Krebsforschungszentrum in Heidelberg, and uh, he spent a time in, at the NIH. And finally, he was uh, at the MP, a director of the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics Chemistry in Göttingen. And uh, after that, he changed to the Max Planck Society as a president. I think gene regulation is uh, one of his most prominent topics, and thank you for coming. You got the Leibniz Award, which is probably the most prominent award uh, in our German science system in 1994, as I remember. Yeah, be sure it is. <laughs> and uh, we will get information from you. How do you see the innovation in Germany in biomedical sciences uh, with the perspective of a science research institute. Thank you. Well, thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. We all, and I think this is a specialty of our species, we are driven by curiosity. I mean, you must be driven by curiosity to get up that early and come here in order to listen to what we are saying. But as Goethe, and this is what I want to challenge you with very early in the morning, as Goethe once said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And I think this is the overarching topic of this morning session, because as you can see, we would like to address the various topics, uh, starting with the person representing basic research, but from a particular angle. 
So what I would like to do, give you the contribution of life scientists towards the innovation chain and try to summarize various uh, issues uh, in this uh, value chain uh, and hand over then, so to speak, with ending my talk to the infrastructure, the framework condition we need. So if I could get to my first slide, here we are. I like to start by, you know, phrasing or, you know, presenting to you the new or more or less new topics and issues that have come up or have been produced by the uh, life scientists using the more traditional, this is not qualifying it, the more traditional hypothesis-driven research. And I like to uh, point out areas of research where I see great potential. It's not there yet, but it will have great potential, and obviously, if there is potential, we have to have the partners in order to explore and exploit this potential fully. So here I start with induced pluripotent stem cells for regenerative therapies. I think we are all aware with the, the, uh, that the big breakthroughs in the recent five to 10 years have yielded the possibility to actually pick differentiated cells, let's say for the sake of the argument, skin cells, and redirect these fully differentiated cells back to a stem cell pluripotency. Now this is referred to as uh, induced pluripotent uh, stem cells, and this, uh, uh, the, the mechanism is fairly well understood, and this has uh, yielded a Nobel Prize, actually, uh, last year to Gurdon and Yamanaka, because it was possible to then uh, produce these cells and uh, as stem cells and redirect them and differentiate them into a particular type of, uh, say, neurons, as you can see here. And what you see here on the left is a, a data set that comes from the laboratory of Hans Schöler uh, that demonstrates that this could be done by a Parkinson patient and that the pathophysiology of the uh, Parkinson is uh, partially reflected in tissue culture. So why is that interested, interesting? Because you can use very complex diseases and try to reproduce a model system which is easily accessible for uh, research, also for the applied type of research, finding uh, products that probably can interfere with that destruction of the nervous, nervous cells. There's a whole battery of uh, elements of new therapies that uh, are at the horizon. Here, for example, uh, genetically modified virus-based vaccines for cancer therapy, a very new line, not preventing the disease, but stimulating the immune system. We have, of course, monoclonal antibodies to fight cancer and asthma, and this was the first breakthrough, I might say, in cancer in terms of personalized medicine. I will get back to this in a, in a little while. Uh, Axel Ulrich, actually a Max Planck researcher who produced Herceptin, Herceptin that is directed to the HER2 um, receptor, uh, which is the causal agent uh, in about 20% of the breast cancers. Or a very uh, recent development, Max Planck also, I should say, holds the patents here for anti-sense therapeutics uh, that are directed to block transcripts from uh, cells of choice. And uh, there are currently, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, between 20 to 30 products in clinical trial. Uh, I would like to point out here the gene therapy to compensate genetic defects. Uh, of course, we are all aware what happened in the first uh, round, let's say, in the initial round of usage of that. Uh, the first clinical trial was in 89, uh, followed by a death of a patient uh, actually uh, uh, having an overload, a viral overload, uh, sepsis and multiple organ failures. And after this, there was a, a, a cessation, there was a block of further studies and clinical trials. We have subsequently then in the uh, exit 
uh, exit, uh, immunological disease, X-linked immunological disease. We have seen uh, some success, however, due to the integration in the vicinity of proto-oncogenes, there were many patients that have developed cancer, so that has also been stopped. Uh, but recently, there has been uh, ways also with new viral vectors, AIV in particular, adeno-associated viruses. And here you can see there are drug approvals in China, uh, in Europe, uh, so this is a route uh, which could help us to actually uh, overcome some of the genetic problems that uh, some of the patients carry. Finally, a very brand new type of uh, you know, possibilities, and this is a new field that has been generated, which is referred to as optogenetics, a field that uh, again has been uh, largely uh, developed in the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, in the laboratory of Bamberg, and what uh, Bamberg did, he used, uh, photo he used uh, receptors and, uh, uh, that can be activated by light from bacteria, halorhodopsin, for example, and transfected these receptors in cells so that he could then stimulate these receptors with light. And I'll give you a wonderful example that comes from an extremely gifted scientist here, Boton Roska, who is at the Friedrich Miescher Institute, uh, and let me first describe the, uh, while showing the, the movie, let me first describe the experiment. What Botond has done, he has actually used a blind mouse, a mouse that has no photoreceptors and has infected these mice with a particular virus using these light-inducible receptor into the downstream uh, cells. This is the ON bipolar cells. So the normal chain of events would be photoreceptor cells, ON bipolar cells, and then uh, it's, uh, the signal is transmitted. So he, this mouse has no photoreceptor cells, has only ON bipolar cells, and they are being infected. And I don't think I need to tell you uh, that this result actually, or that this experiment worked. On the right-hand side, you see a mouse that is uh, blind, lacking any infect or transfected photoreceptors. In, the, uh, in this uh, uh, optogenetic, optogenetic drum, you see a mouse that clearly has, has uh, vision uh, based on this uh, gene therapy. Uh, so I can tell you that this will be a route for many diseases where you can then use uh, light-inducible receptors, and there are several there are receptors now available which you can activate, there are receptors available which you can uh, repress. So it's that much for, you know, some new areas in the hypothesis-driven field. But obviously we are all aware that in the past decade or so, there has been great strides towards a systemic understanding of biological systems. And this is very easily based on the chain of events, uh, starting with a gene, coming to an RNA, protein, metabolites, and in between, of course, the epigenetic modifications. So let me give you very briefly the key points of systems biology. Systems biology is not hypothesis-driven, unless your hypothesis is you need all data in order to make a conclusion. <laughs> Uh, so you have to identify the various elements, genes, transcripts, proteins, cells. You want to identify also epigenetically modified genes by means of experience, so methylations in certain, certain genes. You will have to integrate this information to obtain a view of the system as a whole, and you will have to do computational analysis and quantitative modeling in order to then go back and forth between experiment and uh, assumption to see how this huge network of events in cells and in organisms or in, in organs and in organisms can operate. So this is, for the first time, the attempt to view a biological system as a whole. It's my belief that this in conjunction with the hypothesis driven will change biology dramatically. By means of the analyses, 
there has also been a tremendous advantage. If we look at the original human genome with about two billion US dollar, we are now down to $1,000 per genome. Uh, and this is just the, the first step. Uh, and if, uh, if, if, if you look then at the chain of events, obviously uh, the genome is only giving you a certain glimpse. The, in, the operating unit is the protein. So many people believe that what we need is actually an understanding of the uh, proteome, so the entirety of the proteins in every single cell. And I've uh, shown you this here, and uh, as we now know, this is also quite feasible. Uh, Matthias Mann from the Max Planck Institute in Munich in biochemistry has devised a method that allows him with 100 cells to come up with the full protein. Why is that important? Because it allows you to visualize not just qualitative changes, protein is there or it's absent, but it allows you to actually look at quantitative changes. And if you will be able then to use blood, at least for many diseases, to get a reflection in the blood of a particular uh, uh, proteins, then we really are a great step forward. We take a great step forward in what Lee Hood has uh, referred to as the P4 medicine vision, which is predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. But this, ladies and gentlemen, will really lead to a completely new medicine. It is an informatics-based uh, medicine. It will uh, require uh, people to cooperate. It will attempt to have a systems analysis. It will use what's called the third place. Third place, like PricewaterhouseCooper has uh, indicated, will be in about 10 years from now. 50% uh, of the income will be generated at the person. That's the third place. The third place is the patient it's, uh, himself. With this new devices, and every one of us will have, I think, an iPhone, an iPad, uh, micro devices, uh, it is, has been already possible to uh, monitor about 20 parameters, uh, including, for example, uh, urine uh, checks, including uh, insulin checks, um, so that the uh, level of insulin can be monitored at a much more frequent rate. Uh, so if one looks at this with the third place, uh, if you follow this uh, logically, you will see that we need a complete different infrastructure. We need microrobotics. Uh, we need uh, new technologies in biomed. Uh, we need new ways to secure the data, and uh, the patients have to have these particular data let's say, on the body in a secure form. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I think this will be a real step uh, that will be taken in the next 10 to 20 years. So let me end by then building, if you wish, the bridge. Although, as you can see here, this bridge is interrupted uh, between what basic research can deliver and what uh, industry's job is and how we can interact. Now, obviously, this has been the, uh, the vision of the past. Uh, there is basic research, like in the Max Planck Society. There is applied research, uh, let's say, in Germany, like Fraunhofer and, and uh, many other places, of course. Uh, we have industry. We have industrial research. And if you then look uh, what, uh, where we were in about the, uh, let's say, late 90s or beginning of 2000s, we had the public funding, which went largely, of course, in basic research. It went into applied research. And then we had a reach out of private funding, particularly at that time also a lot of VC capital, a lot of interest uh, to generate and uh, found new companies. Now, I think this simple scheme is not functional anymore. This scheme is outdated so that what we really need is to build a better bridge. And this bridge has to include elements that will be largely funded by 
um, public funds, maybe some of them by private funds. Why? Because in order to attract VC capital, and I'm afraid to say that at least for Germany, there's literally no VC capital in the biotech sector available anymore. Uh, we, we have some private people, uh, business angels that uh, do it. We have, of course, M&A, if I look at my colleagues from, uh, from uh, Sanofi, uh, merger and acquisition of components, uh, yes, granted. Uh, but what the basic research or the tech transfer units of the basic research has to do is uh, sketched here. We have to mature the hit, the result, the experimental result, the idea to something that is um, acceptable by industry, has uh, reduced risk in terms of uh, picking it up and developing it further. So we have, in this context, I've actually uh, lobbied quite a bit uh, in the federal uh, government, and we have from the federal government a very general uh, funding scheme, which is uh, uh, called VIP, it's the validation scheme. So it allows us in every, any particular laboratory, wherever, to apply for money to validate the results. Uh, for the Max Planck Society, we have, uh, and I only want to mention here too, the LDC and the incubators. The Lead Discovery Center is a unique success, a success story that we've built up uh, about three years ago, and it, allow us, it allows us to actually move uh, a hit to a lead. So we have from our laboratories, uh, we have built up large-scale screens. Uh, we allow our laboratories to come up with ideas and concepts. These ideas and concepts are being evaluated by people from business, uh, and then it, they are being proceeded uh, in this uh, lead discovery center, and I can tell you, uh, even in the first three years, we have uh, already several uh, leads. We have corporations with big pharma. So what, what, uh, what the, the point here is, this concept, to mature it, to come up then with a small molecular entity, seems to be attractive for uh, big pharma. Incubators is a, a, a conditio, I, I would say, in order to have it the pre-commercial uh, phase, uh, a mixed funding. Uh, I, will, I always like to quote here Israel. Israel, as small as it is, has about 15 incubators of that sort. Uh, in Germany, there are a select few. I think we have to work very hard to actually come up with this pre commercial uh, unit that is fully funded for about two years in order then to subsequently uh, spin it out. So what does that mean? Yes, I believe the public funding has to shift uh, more towards the applied side uh, the because the private funding has been reduced. Now what does that mean, and this is my last slide, uh, for the future? Today, I think we had a fairly linear progression of events uh, that is shown on the top of the slide, from the discovery, lead development, preclinical, phase one, two, three uh, submission, and then subsequently, of course, the respective product. And we all know the, the failure rate, and as far as, I'm cons uh, as, as I know, the uh, funding for biomedical research in the companies has been steadily going up, but the number of uh, FDA-approved uh, uh, products has remained constant. So there has to be something that uh, we need to change. And uh, what we uh, could change is shown here at the lower half, uh, subheaded by the year 2020, uh, uh, according to Price Waterhouse Coopers. And this rests largely on what I said. We have the hypothesis driven research, we have the big data driven research. But the bottom line of this is we will get a much better pathophysiological understanding of the human system as a biological system. This will, of course, in, to, in turn, give us all you know, for the steps to come, a more precise, personalized way to select patient groups, 
If then you can select patients groups for clinical trials, particular phase three, fewer numbers of uh, patients could be uh, possible. Theoretically, lowering cost if FDA can be convinced. But the bottom line is, it shows a tight interaction between the knowledge producers and between the, um, say, translators uh, that should come from industry. And uh, let me end by, uh, you know, my, my personal experience in the last, say, three to five years. I've never so seen so much opening of the large pharma uh, as uh, it happened in the last five years. Uh, why? Because we need to find ways to uh, work together, ways that is not just a directional research which uh, Big Pharma wants us to do, because as you know, the, 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 the basic research is a curiosity-driven research. It has to be a motivational interaction. And I'm glad to say that we are uh, almost ready to sign a uh, cooperation with Sanofi, um, which allows us on a very informal base initially to share ideas, to discover what ideas can be progressed or processed, and then subsequently decide how to go ahead with this. And this, I might say, is not just uh, an initiative of Sanofi, I think is a general issue, it's, it's a general thrust that I find also if I talk to my colleagues in the United States. So I think this meeting today will give us an ideal platform in which to discuss this means of interface, the means of interaction. And I'm very happy and I'm looking forward to the discussions and to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cruz. So we immediately continue and we will have the discussion afterwards. Uh, I will introduce uh, Chris Fiebacher. Chris Fiebacher is uh, CEO of the Zanofi company since 2008. His training started in Ottawa and he finished, I think the right name is accountant, is that right? Uh, as an accountant. Uh, he worked with Pricewaterhouse, uh, which uh, have been presenting a few for the next years. Uh, and then he changed uh, to uh, GSK, uh, and he is uh, in the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry. So my question is, how can we overcome the segmentation, uh, as Peter Cruz uh, lined out? How can we, uh, what are you saying to the role of industry as a knowledge producer not more in, in, in future times, but more a translator. Uh, do you agree that that is the right way? And we are curious to hear what you can say from the view of the industry. Let me change the slides here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how. Well, good, good morning, everybody. I'd like to, um, to pick up on, on what uh, Dr. Einhoffel, Dr. Gross just said. Um, I, you know, I think uh, what intrigued me was this notion of gaps. And, you know, if you're the CEO of one of the world's largest pharma companies, you're faced uh, in, in very real ways with, with at least three of these gaps. Uh, the first one was what Peter Gross was talking about, which is the innovation gap. If you look at the last several decades, the amount that we invest in research and development, and this is an industry that, that invests in Europe 30 billion euro every year in research and development. But when you look at the returns on that, for every euro we invest, we only get 70 euro cents back. So fundamentally, the model that we have had on research and development isn't, isn't sustainable. Um, and, and there are a number of other gaps in, in that that, that, uh, that Peter referred to, in, in including the, the capital gap. So there's a first gap that you have to deal with is, is running your company, and we spend, as Sanofi, 5 billion euro every year on research and development. 
But you get some very tricky questions from your investors when they say, well, you spent five billion, but you're only, you're getting a negative return on it. And then there's a second gap, and, and that's equally um, difficult because even if you are able to innovate, you're gonna run into a funding gap, and that is on the part of healthcare systems who say, well, you know, we really can't afford innovation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was astounded yesterday to get a question uh, from a journalist saying, you know, uh, studies have suggested that most people will die from something for which there's already a medicine. So why do we even need uh, innovation? So then, there, and then there's a third gap, um, which is quite interesting, which is a competitiveness gap. Because at the same time as, you know, we have an innovation gap, we have a, a funding gap, there's another part often in government that's saying, actually, we want to become more knowledge-based economies. Um, because if we're in Europe, we are never going to compete on a low-cost producer basis. The only way we compete is by having value-added product. And the only way you get value-added product is through some level of, of innovation. So you're confronted with all of these different, um, uh, different forces. So, so how do you, do you deal with this? So let's, let's take all of these things because these gaps are not, uh, cannot be re regarded independently. You have to bring all three gaps back together. And if you do, you actually find solutions in here. The first is, this is a, just a, a, a demonstration of, of really how the, the world has evolved over the last you know, 9,000, 10,000 years. And you can see that actually, you know, for, for, for 9,900 years, you know, not an awful lot really happened in terms of innovation. You know, we, we have obviously uh, pottery being invented here. We've got metallurgy at, at some point in here. But you really see the dramatic increase in innovation really over the, the last century. And, 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 and even if you listen to, to, to what uh, Peter Gross was saying about um, genetics and personalized medicine, um, uh, gene therapy, I mean, this is really starting to uh, ac accelerate. But in that time frame, in that, when that curve is, is going vertical, we've seen an increase in life expectancy, decrease in infant mortality, and we've seen a dramatic improvement in economic growth. Roughly 50% of the growth of the last century can be attributed to better health and, and better sanitation. So the prize here, if you like, is, is that innovation does perhaps for some people in the short term drive some budget pressures, and we'll talk about how we can solve those. But the reality is that innovation is driving a big chunk of, of economic growth and, and well-being. It's also fair to say that despite all of the innovation that has been done, we still have a lot of world problems that are going to have to be addressed, problems that we can't actually address even with, with known medicines today. Uh, the dengue, um, dengue, for example, um, affects probably half the world's population. Uh, probably 25 years ago, it really was an equatorial uh, disease. Today, uh, we have the Florida Keys um, spraying for the dengue uh, mosquito. Um, we've had in the, in the south of France dengue coming north because global warming is causing dengue to, to expand. If you happen to have been in Singapore this year or in, in, uh, Cam in Cambodia or, or Vietnam, um, you've seen actually you've had a very difficult dengue season. We can't treat dengue today, but when people have dengue, they're in the hospital. And in fact, one of the biggest problems is, is that in a, in a dengue epidemic, all of the public hospitals are absolutely uh, filled. Can't treat them, but at the same time, how do you get people in there for cancer and other reasons into the hospital? We have people living on, on less than a dollar a day. We still have uh, major issues um, with water and, and with, with food and, and with the environment. And of course, then we, we start to look and say, all right, um, well, you know, uh, healthcare budgets are already stretched. OECD countries are already dedicating one in every uh, 10 euros that is spent is, is going to healthcare. Uh, can we afford innovation? And, and here's where I, I would say, you know, this is where there's an opportunity. I mean, the first thing is to look at if you're going to start looking at budgets, um, if you're a company or a country, where are you spending your money? Well, <clears throat> you know, the biggest amount of money on healthcare is going to what are called NCDs now, uh, non-communicable diseases. Some might call them chronic diseases. Last night I called them man-made diseases. These are diseases that are caused by the fact that we can eat more, we move less, um, and we are polluting our environment. 
Um, many of those diseases, like type 2 diabetes, for example, can actually be prevented. If we don't do anything, um, the cost to the global economy will be $47 trillion. Um, we would have to uh, have a tax increase to 60% in Europe if alternative funding models not found. I don't know what we're going to do in France because we're already there, 60%. 14% um, of healthcare costs, though, is also related to a lack of adherence. So, so people actually aren't even following, really, the treatments that have been prescribed. So uh, if you want to go into the, to how are we going to reconcile all these gaps, I think there's, there's a couple of things that we can do. The first thing is, as I said last night, we need to transform our sick care systems into health care systems. The, the amount of money that is dedicated to keeping people well, preventing disease, is, is a fraction of what we spend on waiting until people get sick and dealing with it. And, and it's a system that will ultimately go broke because uh, we are seeing an ever-increasing incidence of these diseases. If there are 350 million people today with di type 2 diabetes, there is probably twice that many who are pre-diabetic um, population. Um, so, but we also know that there are a number of diseases that we can't prevent, like Alzheimer's disease. It's estimated that in the United States alone, um, between now and, and uh, 2025, uh, Alzheimer's will cost $50 billion a year to treat, just that one disease. So this is where we're going to have to come back to the innovation gap. Now, the innovation gap doesn't all have to be around medicines. I think there has to be innovation around how do we design our healthcare systems, how do we design our societies, how can we make our societies more conducive um, to better health. But, uh, again, coming back to the, the challenges faced by your average uh, pharma CEO, you know, concretely, what does that mean in terms of, of innovation? So when we looked at it, we found, an, and I, I have the good fortune of having uh, uh, Elias Sohuni, he ran the NIH um, for six years, um, the Hopkins School of Medicine, but he's also someone who has numerous patents associated with his name and, and a founder of five companies. And we looked at it and said, you know, when you look at innovation, innovation means something disruptive. And in companies, the bigger the company, the less likely it was to be innovative. And you could look at companies like Sony, you could look at companies like Kodak, who clearly did not innovate enough. And part of the, the reason for that is, is, is that one is, is that you can't create necessarily the environment in a, in, a, in, a, in a company like that. But the other is, the science moves so, so fast these days. And it is very hard to make a big company move quickly. Whole new branches of mathematics are being developed because of, of what we see in, in, in genetics. We talked about big data. Um, I spent a day um, with uh, the CEO of IBM and, and her head of research and development just talking about something like cognitive computing. What does Sanofi know about cognitive computing? But if you can get into cognitive computing, you can perhaps start to attack this, this big data problem. What if we could actually start to reconcile all these genetic databases with the, the healthcare, um, uh, healthcare databases so that we can actually find a manifestation of a disease that matches up with a genetic anomaly? Well, you can start to do that if you do that, but there's no way that we're going to be able to compete in Sanofi with IBM on, on cognitive computing. Um, is Sanofi going to be having always the, 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 the best expert on nanotechnology, on genetics, on, on, uh, on a number of different branches of, of science? And the reality is no. But does that mean Sanofi should get out of doing research and development? Clearly no, because we actually have a number of competencies that we can bring to the table. It may be difficult to have the innovative idea within a big company. But a big company's probably got the depth of competency to actually define the killer scientific experiment that will validate someone's brilliant idea. And so the trick has really been is how do you bring these two, these two competencies together? How, how do I bring some deep regulatory competency or toxicology or clinical development, understanding about how a medicine is going to be evaluated by ICFIG or NICE or, or Commission de la Transparence. We can bring those things. We can perhaps help someone define whether a project should go, go forward or not. That means also that we have to start changing our own culture because if, if we have a number of competencies that we can bring to someone else, 
we have to actually create a culture of being able to collaborate. The number one difficulty to, to open innovation is actually getting people to work together. You can bring the horse to water, but if, if, if they don't want to cooperate, it's, it's not going to work. And you have some very real people problems. You know, people who work in big organizations think they are smarter than people who work in small organizations. So the small biotech, that's a small company. How smart can they be? We're big. We, we didn't get to be big without being smart. Now, you bring a biotech and a big pharma together, and it is not an easy thing to, to, to create that kind of trust and transparency that has to occur. If you're in the public sector, you look at the private sector and say, well, you know, you guys are all profit takers. Um, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And if you're in the private sector, you think, well, in the public sector, you know, they can keep investing for years and years because they don't ever have to show a result. So these are the, 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 the stereotypes that actually exist. And you want to bring these collaborations together. You actually have to, to, to bring them um, in a different way. And that's why the IMI program in Europe, I think, was so important. The IMI program, sponsored by the European Commission, forces people to be able to, to work collaboratively to be able to benefit from the program. European Commission put a billion euro on the table. Companies like Sanofi can only get a piece of that if we're going to work in a collaborative way, and, and often in new pre-competitive spaces. If we're going to have an innovative drug, we have to have an innovative target. Well, how do we know what an innovative target is if you don't go further back in the science and really understand what generated that innovative target? But that's never been the domain of the pharmaceutical industry. We, you know, you show us a target, we'll generate a molecule for you. Now we have to go earlier, but that's where the collaboration is, is beneficial. And if we do, we can actually perhaps generate even more targets. If we're going to have personalized medicines, we need more biomarkers. Well, Biomarkers could also be in a pre-competitive space, and we could start to, if we work collaboratively, be able to generate more biomarkers. And we're starting to see that, as I mentioned last night, in schizophrenia, we've seen some progress, we've seen in autism, we need to do more in, in Alzheimer's, and we're doing now a collaborative venture as an industry with the public sector in, in new anti-infectives. So, the, to me, the only way that we're going to solve the innovation gap is exactly as, as Peter Gross was talking about, you need new bridges. And you need to create an ecosystem, because what was up on his slide was, in fact, an ecosystem. You need to have people with different backgrounds, different uh, competencies, and different roles. Uh, venture capital is going to be critical to this. Venture capital is a major issue in Europe. Uh, we do not have uh, enough venture capital to really help start up companies. Now, that's why companies like ours are starting to get involved in it. But even in the United States, where venture capital is, is greater, there is still an interest in, in, in uh, working uh, with a company like ours. We actually founded a biotech company in Boston in partnership with a, a venture capital company because we wanted to bring our portfolio, our library of natural substance compounds, together with a professor at Harvard University who had a, had a platform for being able to interrogate that library um, genetically to, to decide whether there's any active drug substance in there. And we can create a company around that. So the funding gap um, and the capital gap is actually forcing people to work together also in ways that they didn't before. As long as money was plentiful, everybody could kind of stay in their camp. The funding gap, in some ways, has had a beneficial impact in that it is driving people into each other's arms, and I think will actually benefit significantly. The final thing was this whole competitiveness gap. There is a virtuous cycle where you invest in people and you invest in education, you invest in those industries that are doing innovation because those industries will be competitive on a world scale. Remember, competitiveness is not a complicated subject. If I'm out there in a, in a different country in the world, I need to do two things to sell, uh, one of two things to sell a product. Either my product has to be cheaper than my competitor's product, or my product has to be better than my competitor's product. Well, with our cost base in Europe, um, I don't think I'm going to win on a strategy that says my product is cheaper. My product, therefore, has to be better. And therefore, in Europe, we need to be focused on, on education and investment. But here's where we have to also, I think, evolve our universities. If you're at Harvard University, they will tell you they have three missions. You have to generate knowledge, you have to transmit knowledge, and you have to transform knowledge. Generate knowledge through research, transmit knowledge through teaching, everybody understands. Transform knowledge is a way of taking that knowledge and finding a benefit for society. 
If you look at MIT over its history, has generated, has created 26,000 companies. If you add the sales up of those 26,000 companies, it is the equivalent of the gross domestic product of the eighth biggest economy in the world. That's called transforming knowledge. Now, I would question whether if we look around Europe, our universities really see their role as part of being transforming knowledge. Not even all of our universities really see their role as it generating knowledge. And yet, that is what's going to make Europe um, competitive and make our companies competitive. And coming back to uh, where we're going to go on healthcare, because the people who say, well, yes, but how do I fund this? You know, yes, healthcare is a right. If I can be provocative for a minute, I would also say health is an obligation. We all have an obligation to be healthy. The best healthcare system in the world is not going to be able to deal with people eating more and eating the wrong things, or if we don't have proper environmental controls, or, or if we're not actually trying to get at outcomes-based solutions. Um, we tend to buy, buy treatments, but we're not always following up whether that, that works. We can do things as an industry. We're doing differential pricing today. We will price this dengue vaccine that we are developing at a price that is going to be um, compared to what people can afford. If you happen to be in a richer country, you will pay more. If you happen to be in a poor country, you'll pay less or perhaps not at all. So there are a lot of things, if we want to, where we can actually deal with the cost of innovation. The innovation is a, an economic driver. And if we can create these, these new bridges, we will be able to gain back um, our strength in Europe. The IMI program is something we should all, as Europeans, be extremely proud of. This is something that nowhere else in the world is happening in the same way, this type of model. So I started off by saying gaps. Um, I think the gaps are what we should be trying to address. But I think if we look at all of these gaps collectively, and not just try to deal with the innovation gap over here, the funding gap over there, and the competitiveness gap in, in another form, if you bring all of these things together, you will find that there is a synergy in the solutions that does enable us to be innovative, that does manage our, our health care costs, and allows uh, our, our countries in Europe to be competitive. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Fiebacher. I think we will have a huge discussion afterwards uh, <laughs> concerning all the statements. So we continue, and I ask Fabio Bamoli. Fabio Bamoli is professor of economics, uh, and he founded the uh, IMT uh, Institute. Uh, it's an institute uh, making research in uh, economy and especially uh, focusing on health. Uh, so he published a paper in uh, Nature Reviews in 2011. Uh, this is titled The Productivity Crisis in Pharmaceutical R&D. And maybe we get some information from you how we can overcome this crisis. Thank you for this invitation. Difficult to speak after two distinguished speakers that uh, leave the reality of research from different perspectives. We, as economists, tend to be observers, trying to do not too many damages, uh, <laughs> influencing action. Uh, I had the privilege to, to work together with the business community and with governments for a while. And so the idea is to give you some uh, stimuli for the discussion at the crossroads between economic analysis and policy, and policy analysis. Uh, so the first point is that in the preparation of this uh, presentation, I decided to focus on the positive side of the moon, not on the negative, and I tried to do it in, a, in an historical perspective. So the first point is that uh, we talk about innovation, industrial growth. Uh, is it relevant for economic growth, for macroeconomic growth, for macroeconomic policies? I think we are living in a period, in an historical period, in which the debate is biased towards you know, public policy, public macroeconomic policy, monetary policy, and fiscal policy affecting the real business cycle. 
I do believe that we need to go back and think about the role of dynamism in our economies and do it from the micro perspective. This is the first point. When we talk about innovation, we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about visions, lives of individuals, and we talk about the possibility that those actions can affect the macroeconomic environment. This is the first point I want to talk about. The second point is that the economy is granular. That is to say, you have events that happen at the micro level, for example, in the life of a big company, and because of the relevance of that company or those companies or those sectors within the economy in terms of share of value added, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, impact on trade, affect the macroeconomic scenario. So this idea that microeconomic shocks are somehow washing away each other is a wrong idea. And I think we need to go back and thinking how industrial dynamics is shaping macroeconomic growth. And, and, first, and the third point is that uh, I would like to talk about uh, two of the many possible broad issues that affect uh, the ecosystem from the institutional point of view, quoting Chris Feeback. So is Europe uh, an ecosystem which is promoting this dynamism, or we have to solve some, some problems and challenges? I'll start with a plot for which I will ask you to be patient one minute, and, and I hope to explain the plot in a meaningful way. So this is, a, a, as you see, a plot in which on the x-axis, I basically computed the entire distribution of the rates of growth of pharmaceutical products in one country, in this particular case is Germany, on a year-by-year -year, uh, basis. So basically here, you are on a logarithmic scale, but here in this area, you have events of big growth, of big growth. So you have products that that particular year grow fast. It's the uptake of innovation. Uh, and the probability that you read on the y-axis is relatively low, is relatively low, you see it's relatively low, but it's definitely higher than the standard economic theory would predict. It will be like uh, having earthquakes of a, given, of a given magnitude, but not being outliers, but being a kind of a linear part of the process we have described. So these big spools of growth, since are there always, and I'll show you, uh, are part of the dynamic process we have described, and not something that we should forget. And this is the opposite. This is what happens when products, I could, I could extract the names of products, here and show you, and I think you will realize that I'm talking about your life. As, 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 as. And here you have pattern expanding. So I decided to come here because I did, I did, I did want to, to provide a kind of boundary to the, 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 to the and, and, and basically to try to explain the, the graph. This is the second plot. So what happens when you go up within the economy? So these are the companies which commercialize and sell these products. And for those companies, you have the very same force. What does that mean? That means that the process we are analyzing, so the evolution of an industry in a given year, is influenced by dynamics, is inherently dynamic. You have products that go up, products that go down, companies that go up, companies that go down, and then you have a kind of a, the rest of the system which fluctuates. And this is basically all the compost uh, uh, sector and distribution in the US, for which the dots represent the pharma companies, and I'll come back to that. And even more interesting, this is the GDP of companies. So we basically computed the rates of growth of the entire world economy, 150 uh, countries that were monitored by the pen tables over 50 years, and this is the result of the growth. So the, the very same process is at work at four different levels of aggregation. It seems like a Christmas tree, and I believe this is why we got the, the cover of the proceedings of the National Academy, the PNL is for that. But basically, this is basically telling us that the very same process is affecting growth at different levels. And it's a kind of a regular feature of our economies. You have sectors that grow up and down, companies that, and the dynamics that happen at the micro level affects, scales up. And this is a, a very uh, quick one. This is basically 
an historical reconstruction of the position of pharmaceutical companies in the US, Compost and Vita, from 1950 to 2012. You'll see the dots, uh, the distribution is the, the, the very same. You see that the variability goes up, but the industry stays in what I call the backbone of economic dynamism in the US economy. So it's not a kind of a peripheral agent. It's kind of the, 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 the large companies are st stable in affecting the process of growth as we know, the dynamics of the economy as we knew it from 70 years of evolution of our capitalist economies. Okay, and even during the period of crisis, that there are several reasons. One fundamental reason is persistency in innovation, driven by effort and driven by demand. Okay? So this is basically what I wanted to talk about first. That is to say, when we talk about the micro level, you know, life of companies and sectors, we are really talking about the core of our economies. We are not talking about so and pharmaceutical industry at the core of the R and D uh, intensity uh, sector is one of the drivers of not only of economic growth but of the way in which economic growth is realized. That is to say, through this dynamic uh, 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 process of creative destruction, I would say, or exploration, I would say. Uh, then there are two points for Europe. One is a challenge that we have as European, uh, and, uh, uh, and Germany has been at the frontier of uh, uh, reforming the welfare system. Uh, 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 thanks to, to the Agenda 2010 and, 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 and to Schroeder, who basically reformed uh, uh, the welfare and the pension system through the RISTER. Uh, 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 but we have a few challenges that are affecting this dynamism that I described and could prevent Europe to be uh, and to continue to be a favorable environment for innovation and growth. And then the second dimension is on research. Are we exploiting the fact that we are Europe? in terms of the, the way in which we organize research, or on the contrary, Europe is still a collection of national systems of innovation which is uh, fragmented. This is the first plot, uh, which comes with a, with a couple of consequences. Uh, this is basically a representation of the consequences of the current funding system of health and pensions in European countries. Uh, I'll, to, to, to make it very short, uh, all the welfare system for the elderly, that is to say pensions and health, is funded through the so-called pay-as-you-go uh, model. That is to say through general taxation and social contribution at a given point in time. That means that those who work at a given point in time are paying irrespectively of the way in which the rules of the pension system are designed, if it's contributive or not, and so on and so forth. But financially, from the macro financial point of view, those who work at a given point in time, firms and workers, uh, are paying for the welfare of those who are already retired. And this comes with a problem, because this system was designed after the Second World War. And it was designed in a period in which population was grow fast and the economies were grow fast. Now, those entitlements, uh, in order to be sustainable, rely upon a key assumption. That is to say that the number of those who enter the labor market at, at, a given point, at any given point in time is higher than the number of those who leave. That is to say we are talking about young societies. If we are talking about an aging society, some of the conditions that you know, draw and that imply the optimality of this system, also from a redistributive point of view, also from an equity point of view, are not there anymore. So we still have a system which has been designed in a period, but then the rules of our society and the dynamics of our society has changed, and we need to think about the consequences of that. This is one of the implications. Currently, you have a person working in Italy, for example, or in France. So you see it uh, from the, uh, on the, on the, on the y-axis that every occupied person in Italy and in France is basically contributing to the funding of pensions and health 
for those who, are, who retired, so for the elderly, with a fraction which is equivalent to about 64% of GDP per capita. Okay? This is the taxation burden on the labor cost. Uh, the figure is significantly lower for Germany. This is basically from the uh, stability and convergence programs of member states, uh, plus uh, computations based uh, on the ECOFIN uh, uh, scenarios. So it's not uh, a kind of uh, an arbitrary reconstruction. It's based on real unofficial figures. Now, there are two implications to make uh, a story short. First, these figures are going to worsen over time because of the fact that the fertility rates still are low and because of the fact that the life expectancy is, is increasing and we do not want to enter here into all the reasons and the drivers according to which we could expect that the expenditure will grow over time. The problem is not to compress this. The problem is how to define a funding rule that can anticipate this evolution and can allow Europe to stay as a dynamic environment. And my impression, I'm strongly convinced about the importance from a dynamic point of view of the German example with the Rister reform. That is to say, having two complementary pillars, not in terms of being private or public, but one funded through pay as you go, so through general taxation, another one being based on fully funded uh, programs, in which the worker and the company have an incentive, a positive incentive to produce in order to accumulate the benefits that they will get in the future. So this is a, a, a question mark. And the second implication of this plot is basically that, as again Chris Fibacher emphasized, and I'm totally in agreement with that, health is not really anymore at the periphery of anything. That is to say, is at the core of our reflections on fiscal consolidation first, on the positive and on the challenges, and at the same time is at the core of our reflections on economic growth. And so any reform that will affect the labor market and the pension system has to be embedded into a, a systemic framework, and we need to think about the complementarities across different reforms and the different financial products that can sustain those reforms. And so let's think, um, in, let's think in terms of reform packages. This is the last slide, and then I'll stop. I'm sorry for uh, this kind of rhapsodic approach. This is on the research side. Uh, we published a few months ago a paper on the European research area for which we analyzed five different networks in research and innovation. This is one of the plots. This is basically mapping and the colors reflect the intensity of the relations. Okay? Uh, this is mapping the co-inventorship network. So we basically identified the location of each inventor okay, in the patents and then we were able to see the co-authors, the co-inventorships, so where, where the co-inventors are located. And this is the result. You know, the US, you have the colors spread all over with a few hubs that allow the periphery to be plugged in into, into the core of the system. Europe is a collection of national systems of innovation. You have France, you can see Germany with many regional uh, uh, clusters. So with a positive uh, articulation of uh, uh, internal diversity, but still build Ger being Germany. And then you have the UK, Italy, and the rest. This is a problem, we believe, because the rhetoric of the European research area did not produce yet, yet the, 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 the integration that uh, more than 10 years of framework programs within the European Union intended to promote. So I think that the experiences like IMI and a reflection on an exposed evaluation of the integrative capabilities of European funds in terms of outputs, not in terms of establishing alliances among research groups in order to get the funds. Because we had this movement in the US, cooperation among research groups is the result of competition. In Europe, is the result of programs artificially designed in order to promote and to improve uh, collaboration. So the incentive to collaborate is not based on the difficulty of the problem at stake, but more on the reward that we get in order when we have partners for diff from different countries. But then when we move to measure the impact 
of some of these problems and for, uh, programs, unfortunately, the impact is not visible uh, in terms of, you know, for example, patent quotas. But I could add other networks, for example, inventor mobilities. Inve the inventor mobility network, uh, again, has the very same shape, with mobility still, still being too an internal uh, affair. So I'll stop here. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to introduce one point about the importance of the economic dynamism. And so the positive value of the business community. Why is that we do have this negative representation according to which now it's the state that needs to do something for our economy? Obviously, there is a complementarity, but there is an alliance that has to be built. It is not the fact that now economic growth will come. They trade in Soviet Union. They failed. So I don't see why we should become, you know, and with the, with the degree of taxation that I basically showed you, what do we want to do? Do we want to increase debt in order to increase further taxation so that we basically found ourselves locked? Sorry for this kind of informal section within the presentation, but really is, uh, uh, I think that we need to, to, to rediscover the importance of economic dynamism and growth and entrepreneurship and innovation when we think about a good life in our societies. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Even I can't reproduce everything you said, I am very much impressed. So we will have a discussion and uh, I will start with a question concerning the presentation of uh, Peter Gruss and Chris Fiebacher. So Peter Gruss said that the knowledge producing, producing uh, uh, is on the academic side and uh, the translator is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I ask Fiebacher, is that your, also your opinion? Well, I, I think, I think the, uh, it, it, yes, it's, it's, it's true. I think the, the difference, though, is, is that I think we need to have cycles between the translation and the generation so that y you can't do everything anymore in sequence. Um, you know, the, the old research model was that, you know, you do some academic research on causes of disease and then someone else picks this up and decides, well, that's a cause of disease, maybe I can think about these targets and we'll validate these targets and then the industry picks up the target and generates a molecule. <clears throat> In actual fact, I think the cycle of understanding has to circulate an awful lot more and there has to be greater um, parallel um, implication of both private and public sector. So. Um, and, and this is where I think a lot more data sharing actually is going to be, be needed. Uh, so, for example, in, in some of the projects that we have funded at very early stages, well, we can actually help on, on, on providing libraries of compounds. We can provide some um, validating competencies to the academic research that could actually determine at a much faster rate whether an idea is going to go or not go. So I think there is clearly a, a, everybody is going to still have their, their, their core competency or core role in the, in the ecosystem and, and generally academic research is always going to be able to have a, a greater diversity of competency, um, will always be more interested in, in earlier stage research and <clears throat> the private sector always is going to be forced to generate some sort of return. But I think that the fact that those two communities come together in a different way can actually accelerate research. Just <clears throat> so that I'm not uh, misunderstood, let, let, let's just try to maybe overly simplify the, the innovation uh, you know, uh, mechanisms. There's clearly a market-driven component this will be pushed by industry and in part by research, be it basic or applied. And you know, if I look at uh, our own organization, uh, we have, of course, in the life sciences, a research area that is very close to application. Look at material sciences, which is very close to application. So in these cases, it's very often hard to discern. But there's another element which is I would say more or less unique uh, for, for basic research, and this is the technology push. 
The technology push by means of breakthrough innovations will largely, not always, but will largely come from basic research. And my point here is, <clears throat> if we come with new technologies, and I try to list it actually a few in the hypothesis-driven area, like RNAi, you first have to feel uh, out you know, with industry. Is that something where industry is interested in? You have to tell them there is potential. <clears throat> and if you look how this evolved, it is a, it's a stepwise process where both partners have to interact. Sometimes industry have to take us by the hand. If you, if you know fields that uh, need, like, like you said, in a circle, lots of basic information, sometimes researchers have to take industry by the hand and point out the possible commercial value of some breakthrough technologies. And, and if I could just compliment, I mean, I think that's the whole concept of translational research, is that the, you know, the real breakthrough we've seen is, is that we don't do research for research. We have to understand how does the research translate to a benefit for a patient. And I think the benefit to a patient is something we can, we can help with in the private sector. I think the other thing is that, you know, <clears throat> you, you noted that my background is as a, as a chartered accountant, um, and I started, I used to, to sort of say, well, I don't have any role in, in R&D. I don't know anything about, you know, um, science. What I've discovered over 25 years in this business is that the, the real success of science is people. It's people who do uh, science, and, and in innovation is an inherently human um, aspect. It, it is at the root of creativity. And having, as, as Peter was just saying, people who challenge each other, can push each other, is actually an extremely important process in this creativity. We, we tend to focus a lot on the technologies, but we forget at the core of all of this is how, how people actually start to develop ideas and, and not only just have the idea, but how do you bring that idea to a market? If there's that breakthrough innovation, how are we actually gonna make sure that that gets, gets to helping somebody at some point? Fabio, uh, what is the role of the industry and what is the role of the public finance research institutions uh, to foster the integrated research area in Europe? I think that first, competition is inherently within the industrial system and the discussion that we had tells us how CEOs of very important companies think dynamically and contribute to generate the plasticity of the system. So the business component has an internal dynamics that forces uh, uh, the, basically the quest for efficiency, for rejuvenate the business models to try to establish a relationship between large and small firms. So for example, this is an industry in which there is not a contrast between large and small firms. On the contrary, there has been a long tradition of complementarity through licensing, co-development, uh, collaboration, partnerships, acquisitions. But it's a kind, really, uh, a, a world in which the explorers and those who have distinctive capabilities in the development, but are also explorers, collaborate because of the fact that those who are, so the large companies have the cognitive absorptive capabilities to interact with those small companies. And those small companies, remember one point, in this industry patent protection has a pro-competitive consequence, also because of this alliance. Because if I am a small biotech company, the only way I have to protect my property rights is through a patent. Then I can sign an agreement with a large company. Without patents, we don't have division of innovative labor. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a footnote, but I, I want to emphasize this. On the, on, the, on the public system, I think we have a challenge in Europe. And we need to find positive examples. So I look forward to seeing some of the IMI experience being analyzed and publicized. Why? Because I believe that there is too bureaucracy in the way in which European programs are managed. And there is not enough competition in those programs. Now, the European Research Council, thanks to Elga Novotny, 
has tried to introduce individual grants that promote competition among scientists and try to give a premium to young scientists. But still, there is too much of an European approach according to which, again, co cooperation is a value per se. Cooperation in research is not a value per se. Cooperation in research is a value when it helps different groups to face uncertainty and to be more competitive. And so we need competitive grants, and I think Europe must improve at that level. Because there is this paradox, which is not a paradox, that the US system that you see plotted in that map is an integrated system because of the competitive mechanisms that were produced by the US agencies, not because of the fact that there were programs intentionally devoted to promote competition. And this is a key kind of paradigmatic change that we need to, to push for. Maybe I can add, uh, you know, coming back to your you know, points that the European landscape is still fragmented in the national sense. Uh, and I, I fully agree with what you said. So also the, the funding, the governmental, say, consideration of funding is a national system. Yeah. And obviously, every country wants to get something back. And I'll give you, you know, the, the German example is, to me, of particular interest. Why? Because we have an all-time low in VC capital. Compared to the beginning of the 2000s, it's uncomparable, particularly in biotech. So you may ask, what can you do? And there, now, now I come to the point. Well, obviously, you have to reduce the risk for the uh, investor. So you can have two ways to reduce risk. Either you give tax benefits, which apparently is not feasible in Germany for a number of reasons. They may reconsider in the new government, hopefully, but uh, for the time being, it's bad. So if you have no tax benefits that reduce the risk for the investor, that's why I was saying, then you have to reduce the risk uh, at another level and make it easier to see the value of the, say, translation area by means of, let's say, uh, validation phase funding. And I think here in Germany, we, we are quite, you know, we are better off than others, I, I would just say. It's not perfect, but we are better off than others. So the discussion is open to the floor. Please introduce yourself and uh, use the microphones. Are there questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you. Really good presentations. Uh, my name is Phil Fan from Johns Hopkins. Uh, the discussion on collaboration is, is quite interesting. Um, it seems to me, though, that the intellectual property regime that currently governs innovation globally um, uh, might have uh, to be uh, thought through, especially in the pre-competitive arena. I mean, on the one hand, it makes a lot of sense to collaborate in the pre-competitive arena, except that if you are trying to collaborate at that stage and you're looking forward to the potential intellectual property and the patenting uh, and the division of gains uh, forward, that might tend to slow down uh, the incentive to collaborate pre-competitively. Can, can you comment on this and what do you think are some of the things that can be done about that? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll take a first shot. At first, it, you, you write intellectual property is is, is a fundamental issue. Uh, one of the one of the I think aspects of the success of IMI was that there was a specific um, flexibility on intellectual property regime that had been built in. Oddly enough, in in the Horizon 2020 uh, project, which will renew IMI, uh, there are some member states who are pushing back on on why do we need this flexibility, but. Um, quite honestly, if you don't have that flexibility, the, the, it, it will just never fly. Um, I think there has been also some move on intellectual property. Uh, I, I can remember uh, years ago that it was, it was the biggest single um, barrier to being able to work even with academic institutions, um, and, and everybody wanted to, to, uh, to compete. Um, to have the, the benefits. Uh, and I think a couple of things have changed over time. And, and I think probably the first is, is that, remember at an early stage of research for every 100 projects, 99 are gonna fail. 
So uh, the, the, you know, fighting over the intellectual property for 99 projects and never going to see the light of day didn't seem to be too productive. And if you could, you know, try to to get two to succeed instead of one, you've already doubled your your, your research output. And and in equal academic institutions have suddenly found that, you know, owning the intellectual property is not the bonanza that that they thought it was going to be. And, and that their business isn't really to be um, drug development houses, but to be these uh, uh, knowledge generators and, and, and also transformers, but in a, in a partnership area. And that it is better off to own a piece of something and try to make it a success collectively than to own something exclusively and it be a failure. And so I think it's been a cultural shift as much as a, a legal um, framework shift. There's, of course, a whole other area about what is patentable, and we've seen recent Supreme Court decisions in the U.S., for example, about um, can, you, can you patent a gene uh, and, and, and can you uh, patent a biomarker, for example. And, and, and some pushback on that, I think, will also make life a little easier because I think the idea is that genes uh, knowledge and, and, and biomarker knowledge should really benefit everybody, and that's why I think you know, if you can be in this pre-competitive space, and pre-competitive space is essentially a pre-molecule space or really pre-target space, then I think you're starting to see people say, hey, you know, we're better off collaborating and finding a solution for the IP than, than, than to stay in our own camps and, 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 and keep failing to the same degree. Well, I can only say, uh, and maybe I, I, I do it in, in more general terms. First, I like to come back to what you said with the MIT. The value of those organizations like MIT or Max Planck primarily is a macroeconomic value. It's not a microeconomic value. If you look at the microeconomic value of MIT, it has been over decades about 30 to 40, 50 million US dollars per year. Now they have a, a new product. It's, I think it went up to 70 million. If you look at the microeconomic value of the Max Planck Society, we are in about 20 million euro range per year. So you need to understand our primary job is the macroeconomic value, not the microeconomic value. However, <laughs> however, this doesn't mean we neglect the, you know, principles that if there is intellectual property, we have to make use of it. This we owe to our societies because after all, we are financed by tax money. So we have done that by means of a very productive uh, technology transfer unit, Max Planck Innovation, and obviously everything you say is fundamental to us. Every one of our researchers can consult Max Planck Innovation, or vice versa. Max Planck Innovation knows in a, in a particular hot area there is something going on and they advise as to what to do with it. Take IT property. Mostly you don't want uh, a patent because the cycle is much too short. You just want to sell it and then go on, write the next software. Uh, however, go, to, base it, go to, to, to life sciences. Obviously, unless you have a patent, you don't even need to talk to industry. So here we have all the processes in line, and I think we are also fast enough, and this is another critical issue that does, doesn't interfere with our primary mission, namely to publish. So we, we have found, I think, a very good you know, way of interaction between tech transfer and publication that I, I don't see actually a disadvantage in, in waiting four weeks, which is max. Uh, in order to patent first, uh, or file a patent, sorry, and then subsequently publish. Uh, two points. The first is, again, the function of IP and patents is not the same in different industries. There is a, a kind of an industry slash technology specific component and uncertainty is the key point. Because the uncertainty which is faced by explorers in this industry is so high that then our evaluation of the patent system has to follow. Second point, uh, I will raise an issue of upstream, even if it's a vague concept, uh, versus more downstream patenting, versus you know, market versus non-market. Uh, gene tags. Uh, companies and universities and centers have started to patent gene tags. Then the fragmentation, many years ago already, 
the fragmentation of the patent landscape was so high that it was convenient for those very same actors to basically put those patent in patent pools and then you know making them public knowledge so i will again emphasize the fact that we have a community both in the private and in the public who's trying to achieve goals and goals of discovery and 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 and, and quest for knowledge and this basically is driving all the process that we have seen at work in the US through decisions by courts, by the Supreme Courts. So it's, it's, it, if we reconstruct the evolution of you know, patent protection in the US is driven by this interplay between you know, new needs that emerge from the exploratory side and the decisions of the courts. There is a great uh, report, a very well-balanced report, done by Richard Nelson from Columbia University and Wesco, and who at that time was at Carnegie, which is a, a very well-balanced report, I believe. And, and, and this relationship between you know, the process of discovery and the evolution of the intellectual property right regime is well described there, too. So I, I think there is an issue is always there, it will be always there, but we also have a system which is somehow learning to solve these problems you know, in a dynamic way. We have time for one short question uh, and a short answer. François Bompard from Sanofi Access to Medicines. We see that we have ahead of us some very exciting scientific innovations, but we also see that they are going to raise important ethical issues having to do with human rights, with equity, even with the definition of what is a normal child, a normal adult, a normal elderly person. So while we don't want these to stifle innovation, uh, we realize also that they are going to drive to a large extent the acceptability of these innovations by society. So my, my question to you is, do you feel that in terms of ethical oversight, we are sufficiently equipped or do we also need to innovate in that field? Well, this is, of course, a very important question, um, which boils down to how do we take our people, our societies along? Um, what are the ethical, moral, legal boundary conditions? And of course, this is an intricate network. Uh, the legal boundary is based on ethic you know, uh, convictions, uh, however, some, in some cases, um, there is a dogmatism involved. I just want to, because it doesn't fit this, uh, this audience, but uh, look at the uh, transgenic plant uh, business in Germany, uh, where it was actually coming from. You know, I, I don't want to reiterate, but Max Planck had the original patent for transgenic plants but see that our companies moved out of Germany because it was not feasible. Now to the legal point, or the ethic point. You know, we are living in a world of flux. Ethics and people's convictions, you know, change over time. Legal boundaries change over time. Uh, I, I still remember when I was young, there was a, 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 a strict law uh, that forbid, that forbid uh, abortions. Now, it is more or less accepted in our societies, given on you know, certain preconditions. Uh, so this is just one little example that shows this is nothing static. But because it is not static, we have to work and convince the people. And there are lots of issues, which I pointed out, where we have to work on people. It is stem cells. It's gene transfer. It's the way we deal with large data to protect, to protect basically, the data of individuals. What do we do with the insur insurance issue? Uh, let's just say, if your predictability is high, by means of your genetic predisposition, you obviously could have completely different rates. <laughs> so the, the bottom line is, these are issues that will come up in the next years uh, and have to be uh, actively discussed. And the more we as scientists or you know, share, uh, stakeholders, the more we 
involve ourselves, the better it is. And, you know, to me, I, I like really in this context Switzerland, because even in, in public votes, they came up with, uh, say, very rational, very rational uh, results in votes uh, that were critical, let's say, for stem cells or other issues. And this is what, what convinces me. If, if we are all working actively on the public opinion, we may basically use the benefit of these new technologies which will come, or else our societies will, will fall behind because in other societies this clearly will evolve. Unfortunately, our time has gone, and uh, I will not try to summarize what has been said uh, from so many experts. Thank you very much for coming, but I have one wish to everybody here. So, if we look to the media, we will realize that pharmaceutical industry is really uh, bashing, that they are bashing the industry. And I think even if they have sometimes, sometimes a right point, I think we all have to fight against those bashings and of course we need also the, in the academic institutions uh, the support of the industry uh, concerning for example uh, the bashing uh, of new technologies which are developed there and I think we all are responsible to really take the public with us on a way which will be very successful, not only in Europe, uh, in the next decades. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for the discussion. Thank you.